Good evening, everybody. I'm Alicia Sams. I'm director of the Pritzker Fellows Program at the Institute of Politics. And we're pleased to welcome you tonight to a conversation unpacking the political and medical landscape in a potentially post Roe v. Wade America. Before one of our students formally introduces our guests, um, I'd just like to mention a couple of upcoming events we have at the IOP and go over some housekeeping notes. Tomorrow, Tuesday, May 24th, Congressman Jamie Raskin will be in discussion with former U.S. Atten Attorney General Eric Holder about the right to vote and the fight for it. This event will take place here at the Quad Club at 530. And on Thursday, May 26th, Nebraska Governor Pete Ricketts will talk about politics, policy, and power and the tension between states' rights and the federal government with CNN's Jeff Zeleny. That discussion will be at Ida Noyes at 3 p.m., and it is our last event of the year, um, public event. We will open the floor to take questions from the audience at 6.40. Um, please line up to ask your question at the microphone, and for those of us joining online, you can send your questions via the chat function, and we will ask on your behalf. Um, please remember that a question ends in a question mark, um, and as a housekeeping note, please make sure your phones are on silent. We will now hear formal introductions from Natalie Ayers, a second year master's student who is studying computational, compu yeah, I did say that right, analysis and public policy. Please join me in welcoming Natalie to the podium. Hello, and welcome to the latest IOP speaker series event, Preparing for the Post-Row Era, What's Next? My name is Natalie Ayers. I'm currently a second year master's student in computational analysis and public policy, and I serve as a graduate co-chair on the IOP Student Advisory Board. I'm delighted to have the chance to introduce our speakers today, who will be providing us a diverse range of perspectives on the leaked Supreme Court draft opinion overturning Roe versus Wade, and what may be in store in a post-Roe United States. Joining us tonight is Dr. Diana Green Foster, a demographer from the Bixby Center for Global Reproductive Health at the University of California, San Francisco. Dr. Foster's research examines the effectiveness of family planning policies and the effect of unintended pregnancy on women's lives, and she's written widely on the harms to women and their children from denied abortion access. Also joining us is Greer Donnelly, an assistant professor of law at the University of Pittsburgh Law School. Professor Donnelly is an expert in reproductive health care and the law, focusing particularly on issues of reproductive justice involving abortion and contraception. We'll also hear from Tressa Undum, a partner and co-founder of Perry Undum, which is a nonpartisan public opinion research firm whose expertise includes issues of healthcare and gender equity. Tressa has more than 20 years of experience in public opinion research, which has included briefing White House officials, members of Congress, and the leadership of the Department of Health and Human Services. Moderating tonight's event is IOP Speaker Series Director Jennifer Steinhauer. Before joining the IOP in February, Jen wrote for the New York Times for 25 years. Welcome to you all, and thank you for joining us tonight. Thanks, everybody. Welcome. Um, I appreciate everyone coming out tonight for, for this event um, on this really uh, important in, topic at this very uh, interesting inflection point uh, in the law. Um, we're here to talk about, as she said, uh, what the world might look like pro uh, row, not to debate the merits of any ruling or, or the uh, abortion, generally speaking, but to turn uh, to what kind of an essentially a, a quantitative eye on what this will mean both in individual states, for women in terms of region, race, other demographics, uh, what, and what polling shows that voters feel about all of this. That's why we have asked these nationally known um, experts uh, on the law, medicine, and politics pertaining to abortion to join us, and we're really so honored that you all hopped on planes to come and join us here tonight. So um, we're sort of assuming uh, that this summer the Supreme Court will overturn Roe v. Wade, and we should caution that we've been here before. Uh, both sides expected the court to overturn Roe in 1992 in the Casey decision uh, and then upheld it. This time the court is significantly more conservative, and of course we've seen the draft opinion from Justice Alito, a longtime opponent of abortion rights that apparently has the votes of the majority. And the justices' uh, questions at oral arguments in December suggested that they were in favor, certainly, of overturning Roe, which would be the culmination 
of years of, of efforts by abortion opponents, brick by brick legislature by legislature to get to this, um, what would be a victory uh, for them, obviously. So Greer, can you kind of walk us through the legal landscape if Roe's overturned? Um, and we assume the, the question goes back to the states to decide and the country becomes what we're kind of think, assuming will be like sort of this patchwork of laws. You wrote with two colleagues that the country will look very different, but you also suggested it would not be the same as the pro row era, it would not be what we, you know, the so-called back alley abortion era. So um, tell us what you suspect things will look like. Great, yeah, so hi, and thank you so much for having me here today. So. Um, so the most important thing to remember is that if Roe is overturned, right, abortion theoretically goes back to the states. Um, and so we know that roughly half of the states in the country are expected to ban almost all abortions with, within a short amount of time. Um, and so what that will mean practically um, is a little bit different than the pre-Roe era because abortion looks really different than it did in the pre-Roe era. Um, so, you know, typically or historically, states were able to enforce and, and um, legislate abortion bans by targeting providers. Many of you may know, right, that, um, that the kind of the line that the anti-abortion movement in the sand that they did not want to cross was to actually go after pregnant people themselves. Um, so states historically went after providers, and it turns out if they threatened their freedom and they threatened their ability to practice medicine, um, then for the most part, abortion um, providers would not offer care in that state. Um, but one thing that's very different about the era we're going into is that abortion is no longer, ne you don't necessarily need a provider's direct involvement. Um, so, you know, before uh, 2000 in this country, right, you needed a, you needed a procedure to have an abortion. Um, but now, in 2000, um, the FDA approved uh, the first medication abortion regimen, right? It's a two-drug regimen, um, mif mifepristone followed by mesoprostol, um, which allows someone to have an abortion, essentially, in the privacy of their own home. Um, and though while the standard of care in this country is still for a provider to be involved, the FDA said in December of last year that that involvement can be via telehealth. Um, so all of a sudden, you have a totally new world um, about where is the location of an abortion when the provider is in Europe and the patient is in Texas, right? What is, where does the abortion occur? Um, and moreover, you have a situation in which patients can actually go online and, actually, and buy medication abortion from international pharmacies and have it directly shipped to their home. Um, and medication abortion, for the record, is one of the, uh, one of the drugs that's been studied um, so very closely. It has an excellent safety and efficacy record. Uh, people have been even studying it in the context of telehealth for years. Um, and so, you know, the world in which uh, pre-Roe, where uh, people who were not able to travel, right, the people who were unable to afford um, going to another state to get a procedural abortion, were really left with few good options in their home state. Uh, the, you know, the, the post-row world is going to look different than that because patients that are unable to travel will have options. Um, and that those options, however, come with legal risks. Um, and so uh, this um, co-authored paper that Jen references with uh, David Cohen and Rachel Ray Boucher really walks through all the legal risks that patients are going to face um, for those who travel. There'll be some legal risks there when you see um, states like Missouri trying to um, create, uh, make it that difficult. And also you'll see patients that are probably face legal risk who stay and try to self-manage an abortion at home. And we're going to move on, but I just want to ask you, can you just illuminate a little bit more by um, elucidate what you mean by legal risk? Right. So, um, so legal risks um, could um, be a, a variety of things, right? It's, it's important to note that people have already been prosecuted for um, ending um, pregnancies, often later pregnancies, under different types of laws like child neglect, feticide, things like that. Um, so those laws could theoretically be used in a post-row context, but um, what my co-authors and I think is more likely to happen is that because it's so hard to target providers who are going to exist outside of the state's jurisdiction, states might increasingly be more willing to go after patients. You saw this in Louisiana. Louisiana recently introduced a bill that was eventually abandoned um, that would have allowed the state to prosecute pregnant people and others um, for homicide, right, in the context of abortion. Um, and so you might see states that are more and more willing to do that when there is no provider to go after. If they cannot enforce their abortion bans by attacking providers, the only way they'll be able, able to do it is by going after patients. Through criminal statute, basically. Yes. Okay. So, Diana, we know that um, these restrictions have been mounting 
happening for years, and there have been many clinic closures across America, as Greer alluded to. You spent the better part of a decade following women who could not get abortions, as this has mounted. What can you tell us, um, based on what you've seen specifically, who has been and would be most affected by new bans? Yeah, so even before this new Supreme Court decision comes down, Abortion is already quite difficult to access across most of the United States. And we find, um, we, I led a study that looked at people who showed up too far along in pregnancy to get their wanted abortion, but they made it to a clinic, at, at which point they were turned away. We recruited people who were just a little bit too far along, people who were just a little bit under the limit who got their procedures and, and followed both groups over time. And so I can tell you a little bit about the um, denial but to add just to Greer's comment a little is that this getting pills by mail is may really change things when that knowledge is disseminated. But there will be people who can't get the information, who don't have the money, who can't order things online for all sorts of reasons, who won't be able to do it. And so it is clear to me that um, probably about a quarter of the people who are pregnant who would have otherwise gotten an abortion will carry a pregnancy to term, it's my estimate, based on uh, when, for example, states ban Medicaid from covering abortion, about a quarter of the people who would otherwise, oh, the mic is picking me up, it <laughs> likes that point, um, end up carrying the pregnancy to term. So it's something like that. And what we find when we look at the people who are denied abortions um, is that and note that these people were too far along, so there weren't very, there weren't other options for them. They pretty much had, um, were um, going to have a baby. And what we find is um, immediate uh, health implications because most people don't realize that carrying a pregnancy to term is associated with much greater physical health risk than having an abortion, even an abortion later in pregnancy, even a you know second trimester abortion. Um, and then it actually, we follow people for five years and we see long-term effects on lots of aspects of life. So our main question was, does abortion hurt women in terms of mental health? That was the conversation we were having back in the early 2000s. And um, so we, our questionnaire was full of mental health screening questions and we find very little mental health harm from abortion or from carrying a pregnancy to term. There's a short-term harm from denial in terms of greater anxiety. But there are very big differences between the cohort who gave birth and the cohort who got their abortions just under the limit in terms of much greater physical health risk. And it's not just the immediate end of pregnancy, it's for years later, they report worse health and uh, greater hypertension, greater um, chronic pain than people who got their abortions. And then socioeconomically, the leading reason people give for wanting to have an abortion is they say they can't afford to have a child or to have another child, and we see that they're right. We see increases in poverty, increases in reporting that they don't have enough money to meet basic living needs. And when I worked with economists from the University of Michigan, and um, now she's at NYU, um, we looked at credit reports, which show you evictions and outstanding debt, and we see from this objective financial bureaucracy that collects all public financial data, you can see that the women who are just above and just below the gestational limit um, were the same for the three years prior to pregnancy, and the five years later, the, that difference never converges. So there's ongoing socioeconomic consequences. And we'll return to um, some specifics on that, too. Um, but I want to talk about the politics of this, because obviously there are very few issues in American life that have had such a um, protracted in obviously emotional content um, to the debate and, and it's, some of it's been framed um, in ways that the polling data doesn't necessarily match up to. So I was hoping, uh, trust you could help us with that. Um, your polling has found a disconnect between public opinion and the public debate. Um, for instance, we, we often hear that uh, people who struggle with abortion, they find it, that, that their views are morally fraught. And you found, in fact, that most people say they do not struggle with their political um, attitudes on abortion. What are some other misconceptions you found about abortion? Who gets it? Who supports it? Um, for example, I know there's a common perception, for example, in America that black voters don't support abortion. So can you unpack a little bit of this uh, for yeah. us? So I've been doing public opinion research for, for 20 years, and, um, and, and on this issue, um, 
you know, now and again over the course of 20 years. And I would say starting maybe four or five years ago, everything I thought I knew about opinion <laughs> was either never right in the first place or out of date or no longer true. Um, so yes, so um, people don't sit around. If you only look at conventional wisdom and media framing, you might think this is really polarizing. This is a divisive issue. Uh, people like super struggle with the complexity. Um, it's religious, um, all of those things. So right, people do, don't sit around struggling with their view. Do they think it's a gray issue and that depends on the circumstances? Absolutely, but do they sit there thinking, I struggle with my political views on this? No, they, they know their political views. Um, a majority, this is not, I think it's like 69% say this is not a, a religious issue for them personally. Um, it's not really polarizing. A majority, um, at least on overturning Roe or not, consistently a majority um, has supported that. Um, black voters are among the most um, pro-choice, um, the most likely um, to see harms, the most likely to connect the issue to a number of other issues. Latino voters, you might think, oh, they're more likely to be Catholic, they're more likely to be uh, anti-abortion. Not true. Latino voters for the past decade have looked exactly like the electorate. Uh, Non-voters um, um, are more likely to be anti-abortion, but the electorate, um, very similar. So there's, there's just been um, a ton of, ton of changes, and I think, you know, public, Everything we know about uh, public opinion on this issue comes from like maybe eight pollsters that the media only re only reports on Gallup, Pew, ABC News, Washington Post, New York Times, CNN, NPR. These are just a handful of people, right? They are busy pollsters. They don't do qualitative work, so they're not talk they're not doing focus groups, they're not hearing people talk about this issue, and then they only ask the same three questions over and over and over again to track over time. But those questions aren't the interesting questions. So we can, I went, you know, I, I'm like an explorer. I can ask, I mean, this topic isn't, this topic isn't about a procedure. This is about way more. This is about pregnancy. This is about who controls decisions. This is about your views toward women in power. So I get to ask, because none of these pollsters go beyond this, you know, narrow view. I get to ask all these questions like, okay, if men were the sex to get pregnant, do you think access to abortion would be easier or not? Right? Majority of voters say yes. Um, I, I've asked questions about to you know people 18 to 44, women uh, 18 to 44. Have you ever felt dread or panic at the thought you might be pregnant? A majority say yes. So uh, there's just like a million questions I've asked that are so so much more interesting and actually contradict what we all think. Um, people think about oh, abortion. I want to get back to the law in a second, Greer, but I want to just ask one quick follow-up. Um, when I think about crime, taxes, other issues, those tend to evolve with age, um, and sometimes it's changing geography. Is, does, do, do views on abortion um, tend to, do you, are you able to tell, evolve as people get older? So this is really interesting. For the past, I don't know, 20 years I've been looking at data, there hasn't been a generational divide, so it's pretty flat. However, in the past few years, now it's not. Only 18 to 29 year olds are, I think the last Pew poll had 20 points more pro-choice than people 65 and older. So that's new, but historically, no. And I think in qualitative, I think, you know, people in high school, no one really grows up as a kid being like, oh, I'm for abortions, right? And so in high school, you know, I think people t might tend to be a little bit more anti-abortion, but once they get a few years experience, if they go to college, you're talking about, you're learning more experience. So I think that the evolution might happen at that age, but not. Got it, got it. Yeah. Um, let's talk a little bit more, so I think, what people are trying to unravel is um, legal consequences, right? It's, especially since we talked about these patchworks. So um, here's a specific question. Do you imagine that there will be penalty for out-of-state conduct? Which is to say, if a woman from Oklahoma can get the money in time to go to Connecticut or Colorado to get an abortion, can Colorado punish the abortion provider in those states? Um, there are two cases, both from the 70s, I think, that uh, illuminated some of this for us. How can, can you walk us through that a bit? Yeah, so uh, my co-authors and I are really concerned about the possibility of, of anti-abortion states trying to legislate outside of their borders. 
Um, and so one of the reasons we think about this is, right, the anti-abortion movement has not been, uh, you know, shy about saying that their goal is to end as many abortions as possible, right? Many people in this room know that they are um, actively contemplating both a federal law that would ban abortions nationwide and also a constitutional challenge that would hopefully ban abortion nationwide. Um, and while they're seeking those things out, right, um, they will probably, many states, probably the most anti-abortion states, will try to use whatever state powers they have to chill or stop abortions that are happening on their citizens outside of their state's boundaries. Um, and so Missouri gave us, um, the, just recently gave us kind of a, a preview of what that could look like, right? So. Um, Missouri introduced a bill, it was not pursued, um, that had the kind of um, SB8 style civil mechanism that would create civil liability for anyone who helped someone leave Missouri to get an abortion. It's not surprising that this was Missouri. Okay, Missouri is a state that has regulated abortion almost out of existence, such that almost every Missouri citizen who needs abortion goes to either to Illinois or to Kansas, right? So it's not surprising that Missouri legislators, the anti-abortion Missouri legislators, regularly visit the Planned Parenthood that's right over the border in Illinois. Right, so it's not surprising that they're the ones thinking about this. Um, and so if they were to try to do that, right, it would raise a lot of constitutional questions. Probably many people in this room assume that we have the right to freely move in between states. Um, and so, you know, what would happen if a state tried to create civil liability for that? Um, you could also imagine a state like Missouri trying to prosecute providers that are in another state for providing abortions on their citizens. And unfortunately, the conclusion that my co-authors and I reach is that actually the law is extremely undeveloped in this area, um, and there is you know, a lot of uncertainty that could allow anti-abortion courts to say that actually that is permissible. Um, and one of the conclusions we reach is, is actually that um, even though there's this view that if the abortion law goes back to the states, it'll be clear, right? Every state can just decide what they want to do. The reality is much more complicated because states like Missouri are going to try to legislate outside their borders. States like Connecticut, you know, Connecticut just passed a law that tried to insulate its providers from out-of-state prosecutions. We're going to see this warring state um, uh, situation that's going to come up a lot more. And let's talk, um, pivot from that, Diana, to talk about how that would impact uh, women who are seeking abortions. So we know some states, like in Illinois, as you alluded to, are moving to set themselves up as sort of abortion havens, right? So is that a solution that's practical? Um, a woman going from Maryland or California or Connecticut, is that feasible in terms of uh, some of the women you looked at in terms of their financial or family situations? Yeah, so in America, um, people seeking abortion are disproportionately low income, okay. um, but everybody who can get pregnant in every demographic. There are people who have abortions. Um, wealthier women definitely are um, get them a little bit faster because they're not the leading thing that slows people down is trying to raise money to pay for travel or to pay for the procedure. So if Roe is overturned and people have to travel big distances, wealthy women will definitely be able to do it much faster and they'll also have the computer and they'll have read about pills online, uh, aid access or plan C or there's a bunch of them now and they'll probably get their abortions quickly and um, low income people will have a lot of trouble. Um, minors, um, imagine being 15 and 300 miles from somewhere you need to go that probably also has a parental involvement law. It's and then you get there and you need judicial bypass. I mean, the, the barriers are already really hard for minors, and this will be, uh, it'll be a population that absolutely will um, have more difficulty. And then groups that are totally overlooked, usually um, disabled women, and particularly women who are inpatient in hospital, um, you can't just pick up and go. Um, and um, the idea that those people don't need abortions is wrong. Um, so, There'll be, um, yeah, this, this is a law that will, you know, further um, increase disparities because what the Turnaway study shows is that people, when they are unable to get a wanted abortion, become poor, and they, poor people will disproportionately not be able to get their abortions. So, um, Tressa, in terms of the states, you know, um, anti-abortion, um, advocates would say this is the way it should be, right? Return the question of abortion to the states where it can be decided according to what the residents of those states want and the legislatures that they elect um, subsequently. So from what you've been able to tell from your work, do these new bans reflect the will of people? Um, 
What do the polls tell us about what Americans think about abortion law and about Roe? How, how truly divided is America um, per these states and their, what they've been doing so far? It, honestly, it's kind of hard to answer that for the for the reason I alluded to earlier is there's just this handful of polls. So um, we'll, we'll probably see over these few weeks, um, you know, should abortion be up to the states? That's a, and you know, we, we might see, I wouldn't be surprised if we saw half of voters say yes. It's sort of like an embedded cultural thing in our country, like yeah, up to the states. Um, we probably aren't going to see polling that says, um, do you support or oppose, um, you know, women not having um, guaranteed reproductive rights anymore? You know what I mean? So it's like, okay, women are, are across the country are losing their rights. We're probably not going to see polling around that. We're probably going to see, like, up to the states. So um, it's a little bit hard to, hard to tell. I think the ground will shake a little bit. I think it did a couple weeks ago, and I think it will, will again. And it's also hard to tell because even the state level polling we have, um, you know, it tends to be like, do you support or oppose a six week ban? And then that'll be in Texas or wherever, right? And you might get half saying I support. Okay, when I've, the problem is these questions aren't validated either. So I've replicated those questions, that exact question. And then I've said, um, Okay, which comes closer to your view? So let's say I let's say we just get half saying yes. Which comes closer to your view? I want my state um, politicians to pass a new law to ban abortion after six weeks, or I want them to stay out of the issue. Oh, majority are going to say stay out of the issue. So even though us pollsters say, okay, do you want abortion legal in most cases or legal in these cases? And then you say, or you know, only legal in rape and incest. You ask these and then you ask, you follow up and say, do you want a law passed that reflects what you just said in that pre previous question? You get most people saying no. About 60 to 65% saying no. So honestly, it's really hard. It's really hard for me to say. I think in states like Louisiana, Mississippi, sort of the reddest states, I think my guess is people are pretty divided. Like there might be, um, I, I, in terms of like what kind of restriction and how far away, most people don't want it illegal, um, even in the reddest states. Um, but yeah, it, it's hard to tell. I th I'd say, you know, when it comes down to it, what I've learned in all of my research is, yes, you can ask, what about this? Should we, there's a poll, of, I was telling Greer earlier, there was a Harvard um, public, um, school public health poll about, you know, abortion at 24 weeks. Do you favor or oppose? 60% oppose. Okay, the other, you know, one survey asked that, another survey said, okay, Zika, let's say there was a case of Zika and, you know, there's a fetal anomaly, whatever. Oh, suddenly 60% support. So it's like you can ask polls, but people have, one thing people all have in common is they don't know one thing about this issue. So, so you could say, do you support this? Do you support that? Um, yeah, well, what about this? Well, oh, okay, no, well, then I wouldn't support it. So it's like when you get down to, when you ask all the what, uh, what ifs and you get down to it, my sense is where most people are is it's about who makes this decision. Who has control over it? Is it you? Is it individuals, you know, depending on the circumstance, or is it the government? And that's kind of like, mm. it's, that's at the core of it, and then your beliefs about, um, you know, when life begins, and then your beliefs, which you won't hear from these eight other pollsters either, it's about your beliefs toward women. So I don't know if I answered that. Yeah, Hard to know, I but... Was, I was going to ask you psychological questions, then I realized you weren't a psychologist, you're a pollster, so you don't know why people are so inconsistent, but it sounds a lot like what you're saying is, in fact, what underlies it is, is uh, lack of information. Right. Um, although you did uh, uh, tickle my interest a little bit, if you just could give one more flavor for this notion about how people feel about women and what you mean by that and how that's a pollster item that, doesn't, that gets off the list. So what are you, what are you talking about there? So, for example... Um, you know, we, I was in a focus group one time, and an uh, anti-abortion woman in Texas said, um, I think these women who have abortions just want to be a big dog in some company, and they don't want to spend the time properly to raise a child properly and divide their attention. And I was like, whoa, because most women who have abortions are at near or below poverty. Like, this is not at all a fact. Where is that belief coming from? It's about how she feels about women. 
So when I started looking at, you, you know, measuring hostile sexist views, so um, are there differences by um, your views on abortion? Well, if abortion were only about when life begins, how you feel about babies, there were, you wouldn't see sexism vary, right? There'd be sexists across the board. Um, but in fact, a majority of anti-abortion people say things like, oh, women are too easily offended. Um, they say things like a majority of anti-abortion people um, actually disagree that they want equal positions of men and women in power. So if you support abortion rights, majority agree, I want equal positions of men and women in power. If you support it, uh, if, you, if you're anti-abortion, you disagree, okay? Me Too movement, are you favorable toward the Me Too movement? 71% of pro-choice people are, 22% of anti-abortion people are. Um, do you agree or disagree that our society punishes men um, these days um, just for being men? Majority of anti-abortion voters agree with that. Pro-choice voters disagree. And this is true across states, across economic groups, across all demographics? Well, or, I mean, I can, some people I, clearly feel this is pure, you know, do frame this purely as a religious issue to them. Yes, but those people also tend to have these views. And even if I look at, let's say, Republicans, and I narrow the lens to Republicans, Republicans who have more egalitarian views toward women are more pro-choice than those who don't. Right. Interesting. Um, so, um, Greer, let's go back to um, some of the nitty-gritty uh, on the law. Um, so... Um, if states start moving to define life as beginning at conception, um, as Oklahoma just did, there's a lot of questions about what the potential consequences are for birth control that works to prevent implantation, such as IUD, such as morning after pill. Um, can you talk about that and also perhaps um, about the p potential impacts for IVF? Yeah, so I mean, I think it's just, I feel like everyone needs a little bit of a sex ed lesson, right? That the pregnancy, you know, the medical definition of pregnancy is at implantation, which is right generally two weeks after conception happens. Um, and so there's a, lo a lot of people who aren't fully understanding that. So what does it mean when you def when you define life as starting at conception? Um, well, one of the one of the first things that comes up um, is whether or not um, you know the anti-abortion movement has perpetuated the idea that certain types of uh, contraceptives are abor abortifacients because they stop implantation, right? So the two that they talk about the most are IUDs and Plan B. The idea is that uh, those two types of contraceptives work not by stopping fertilization, but by stopping implantation. And if you think life begins, right, at conception, at fertilization, that anything that interrupts that process of implantation to them, right, is an abortion. It's important to note that many, most of the scientific um, scholars in this area disagree, right? They think that Plan B and IUDs actually work by preventing um, conception as well as implantation. Um, but the one thing that you, that's really going to come up next is this idea of, well, can... Um, I'll, I'll, there, was a, there was a Supreme Court case, right, that um, from about... 12 years ago, uh, which considered whether or not states can have different ideas of facts, right, when it comes to abortion. So this was in the context of um, what the, the Federal Partial Birth Abortion Act, which was uh, the medical uh, term for that is a DNX abortion. These were uh, second trimester abortions that were often, that were done, um, and, you know, the federal government tried to ban them. The question was whether or not it had to have a medical exception, right, because constitutionally under Roe and Casey, if there was if it was necessary to save the life or health of the mother, it was supposed to have that exception. The state said there is no circumstance in which that could ever be true, right? Um, and the Supreme Court said, state, you are allowed to make that medical determination, even though it's against what the traditional scientists said, right? Traditional scientists said sometimes it is in the best interest of the pregnant person to have this specific type of abortion, right? So you've already seen the Supreme Court have to grapple with these issues of questioning facts, right? What are the facts? Um, and when there is a minority uh, anti-abortion view that contradicts with the majority scientific consensus, the Supreme Court has been willing to let legislators decide. So in the context of a state that says abortion or life begins at conception, then uh, if they also believe, right, that certain types of contracept contraceptives prevent implantation, then you can, they can, you know, by law say that that is an abortion. 
And if Roe is, Ro is gone and states are allowed to ban abortion, right, the state gets to decide what that abortion is. Um, and so it is very concerning to think about what's going to happen in the context of contraception. And I'll just m mention also um, that, you know, a lot of the rights that we think about in terms of contraceptives, in terms of LGBTQ rights, were all built on the building blocks of what's known as substantive due process, which was um, you know, created through the abortion and contraceptive case law. And so with the court overturns Roe, there's also the big fear that constitutionally speaking, the building blocks start to crumble, and we start to worry about all the other rights that could crumble with them. Um, and so that's the other reason why constitutional law scholars are really concerned right now about what overturning Roe could mean for other rights that we hold dear. Can you just uh, maybe foreshadow, we can get back to this too, but foreshadow what some of those rights um, are, people are most concerned about in the context of constitutional law? Yeah, so, so the two that people are talking about a lot right now is contraceptive, right? So there's not only the, you know, the, uh, the right to privacy, not only guaranteed people the right to abortion, it also guaranteed people the right to contraception. Um, so though, you know, states claim, you know, putting aside emergency contraceptives and IUDs, states are claiming that they have no interest in attacking contraception, right? But theoretically, if Roe, you know, the overturning Roe puts the whole right to privacy in question. Theoretically, it opens up the door for challenges about whether or not a state could ban contraceptive, period, right? Um, again, that a lot of things would have to happen for that to come into place. But the other one is Obergefell, right? The, this, the Supreme Court case that guaranteed people, um, same-sex couples, the right to marry. Um, that, those, that decision was based in part on the right to privacy cases that were established under the abortion context. And so there is ve very, a lot of people are very nervous about what that means for, an, for an, um, a, you know, a conservative movement that is actually openly interested in attacking that right. So I would um, love to hear from both of you respond to that in terms of what your work shows. Um, a theme that seems to be emerging here is knowledge, right? Accumulated knowledge and how much people are educated about and know about uh, pregnancy, about abortion, it's, uh, medically, um, uh, and contraception maybe. Do you, in your polling, in your work, um, either of you step in and, and see if um, him respond to what Grit has explained to us to see if that resonates with people that you talk to, um, both in terms of the broader legal implications, but even in their, con their concept of how this may connect to contraception? Oh, I want you to go first. <laughs> oh, I don't think people have any idea yet mm -hmm. that this is connected to contraception or um, contraceptives or, yeah, I don't think they have any sense. I think probably the first people who are going to find out is, um, you know, young women. Right. Um, and even like in Texas, I was doing focus groups in Texas after that ban went into effect. And um, for the first time, I heard p young women being like really scared. And, and, you know, one woman was like, okay, I went on a day. And this was six weeks after it went into effect. And she's like, I went on a date last week. I did not let him come up to the apartment. Um, I'm terrified. I don't know what I would do mm -hmm. if I got pregnant. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that's probably where it's going to start rather than, you know, the general public suddenly becoming more knowledgeable. I would be, I'm skeptical of the idea that people are going to change their um, way that frequency or partners or anything to do with sex in response to this. Um, because people don't seem to know what the law is now, and people have sex without thinking they're going to become pregnant. They're not, like, deciding that we'll just take a risk because it'll be fine, I'll just get an abortion. Like, I don't think anybody thinks that. They don't think they're going to get pregnant. So I will be very surprised if, if all of a sudden everyone abstains. And, um, um, and the thing about privacy, um, you know, I've heard that Ruth Bader Ginsburg had criticized privacy and it should have been equal protection under the law. Um, but there, I don't, the privacy thing, before I knew much about this, I thought it was like, oh, sh I don't have to tell anyone that I want an abortion, you know, which is not what privacy means at all. It's about, um, do, is this the kind of decision that the government makes for people or is this a private citizen's decision? And given the ramifications of having a child or not having a child, it is, seems so, so um, critical that this be a private decision. And, and 
one thing that I learned from the study of talking to people about why they want abortions and the consequences when they can't is that these are people who often have tight circumstances, their lives aren't going perfectly, and when they're making a decision, they understand very well what will happen if they can't get an abortion. And they're making the best decision they can for their themselves and their families and their existing children and their aspirations to have children later. So it's like this, there's no way that the government making a gestational limit at 15 weeks, which is now the best we could possibly hope for, or a total ban would result in better outcomes for people. And I'm wondering um, how much people connect themselves to other people in this. Um, and I'm not asking this totally coherently, with, but bear with me. I feel like I hear a lot of young women who you might, who are very politically active on other issues, who you might have expected, or women from other generations might have expected to be very exercised about this, if in fact they support abortion rights. I see a lot of young women who um, uh, do not support abortion rights, who are in fact very active in this, and the pro-life movement in Washington is a huge youth-fueled youth movement, as I'm sure you know. But a lot of times what I hear is, well, I live in a blue state. So that's not going to be a problem for me. So I'm curious, again, if they, if they are, um, I'd love to hear from all of you, um, whether women who frame it that way um, are being politically indifferent to others in a way that they might not be on another issue, um, and what might underlie that, because that's sort of interesting, or if they're being, in fact, naive about their own circumstances. And I'd, I'd love to hear anyone chime in on that. I kind of feel like... Um you know, talking to, it used to be when I do focus groups, um, it used to be we'd screen out, frankly, people like in their early to mid 20s because mm. they didn't have opinions formed. They'd never talk in the groups. Um, they'd have nothing to contribute. So it was a waste of a chair. Now that 24. You're not a waste of a chair, just FYI. You're not. You're, not, you're, you're, not. you're now, like, we're you're really happy smart, to have you in a chair. Just you're the to smartest, be clear. most sophisticated, <laughs> I'm not kidding, wisest person on the, it, around the table, hmm. especially young uh, people of color. Mm -hmm. So I, I kind of say, and, and the polling is, like I mentioned, like Pew, 75% of young folks are um, support abortion in all or most cases. So I think what we're seeing from the media of like this big anti-abortion young group movement, I think that's the media framing, frankly. I mean, when I, when I talk to young people, um, especially more progressive people, they're very passionate about this issue. Not so much like maybe older women are, but they connect it to like every other issue. Mm -hmm. They connect this issue to police violence, to bodily autonomy. Bodily autonomy is related to police violence and all these other things. Um, they're just way more, way more sophisticated. It's about power, it's about control, it's about who has power, who doesn't. Um, so yeah, that's kind of what I see. Um, in our research, at least. And I mean, I'm not saying there's not a strong anti-abortion. There is, but in terms of the clearly. numbers, there's also a strong, you know, very sophisticated, attitudinally um, other cohort of people. And so you mentioned that some people might feel safe being in a blue state, and I just want to, you know, say that, that that is a myth, right? So this idea that so many people have Oh, that I'm going to be protected because I live in New York. Well, guess what? That's, all your clinics in New York are going to be flooded with out-of-state patients, and you're not going to be able to get an appointment for a month, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so it is not true that anyone is going to be left unscathed by this decision. Um, and, you know, it's also worth noting in, in terms of side over effects that this has um, not only effects on birth control, but right, people who are trying to get pregnant and experience miscarriage are going to have a lot of problems because of abortion laws, right? So the idea that, um, I don't know, the idea that you're safe because you're trying to get pregnant because you live in a blue state, right, it's just everyone is going to be affected by this and it'll probably take time for those stories to percolate and for people to recognize it. It's not true that anyone is safe. Did you have anything to add to that in terms of your own work? No, it's devastating. Uh, I didn't. I have not heard that. I mean, in California, we're so far. It's that I, I think we're that Southern California has experienced some inflow of Texans, but it has not. I don't. 
Yeah, I just hadn't thought of. Yeah, like there was, um, there's clinics in Minnesota actually that just with the influx of patients from Texas alone were at the brink of their capacity. Um, right, so I mean, I am in Pittsburgh. I'm in actually one of the, I think, seven states that are going to be the most inundated with with patients. We're, we're just in this regional place where all the Ohio and West Virginia folks are going to come, so we're really screwed. <laughs> um, but it's, it, you know, what happens when it's not just Texas, right? Texas really stressed the whole abortion ecosystem in itself, right? There are there are three week wait periods and in in clinics all over the South. What happens when half of the clinics have to now serve 100% of the patients, right? It's just, it's going to, it's going to be tough in the beginning. Then do people and, understand this? Do you think people are caught on to this? Would you say? I don't know. I was just going to add one, which is uh, it's the southern part of Illinois that will also be completely yeah, right. swamped. Yeah, southern Illinois. Interesting. Um, yeah, it feels like this is many of these components that you're all raising. Um, they're not uh, under. They're not uncovered, but they they don't. I don't feel like they've resonated or really sunk in uh, nationwide. Does that seem fair? And there's probably insurance implications and economic implications, obviously, as well for states. I would think. I'm Greer, sorry. could you tell the story you told me in the taxi or not? Oh, <laughs> taxi tales. Oh, um, or what we might see. Okay, yeah. So um, let's. So you know, in terms of the of people who for are going the the types of people who are going to really struggle who are not just abortion patients, right? So we talk about miscarriage management already in Texas. You see that um, it's hard for people who are experiencing missed or incomplete miscarriages to get the drugs they need to help them um, have the finish the miscarriage. But also there are people who need medically necessary abortions um, in Texas already who are fleeing while they're in the middle of labor um, because the, you know, the, their, the hospitals in Texas think that the standard is you have to wait until the woman's life is threatened, right? And so what happens when a person goes into labor at 18 weeks long before the fetus is viable, right? There's no chance to save the, the baby in this context. Um, the standard of care is to do an abortion. But what happens when abortion is illegal except for to save the life of the mother? Well, you wait until the woman is near death to give her the abortion, right? And so already in Texas, NPR did an expose on this, but we've seen it already in the uh, hospitals in Pittsburgh where doctors are essentially telling women who are in labor to get on an airplane, show up in an ER in a place that you can go get to. Um, and so, you know, uh, it's, I, you know, I think that people don't really realize that this, like these are the consequences we're gonna start seeing. And this also goes back to, this is why it's not about religion. This is a wanted pregnancy yeah. woman whose life is on the line, who has to get on a plane to go to another state. That's not about how you feel about, you know, when life begins. I mean, you should read the NPR story, uh, the woman's story on the NPR, because she, you know, the, 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 the doctor in Texas was saying, make sure you're on the aisle, because if you go into labor, you might need to get into the bathroom, right? I mean, these are horrible, horrible things. Um, and I'm just curious, when people talk about those particular circumstances, do they use the word abortion when you're talking about, um, obviously, oh. when, you, when you're talking about uh, uh, completing a miscarriage, uh, we yeah. use different language, GNC, or, you know, do people are using the same language. I'm, I'm wondering if this is um, contextualized for people. It's really interesting because I think that due to abortion stigma, there's been actually like a lang an attempt to have like a language distance between a lot of stuff. So, you know, sometimes that exact situation would be called, you know, miscarriage management, even right. though it's an abortion, right? Um, you, you see this in other areas, right? Selective reduction is an abortion that's done when someone has multiples, but right. it's actually safer for them to have not as many babies growing in their body, right? So they abort one. Um, you know, there's a lot of ways that we kind of have distanced ourselves from the word abortion that actually I think is probably does a disservice to the movement because it, you know, abortion is healthcare. And the more people are able to recognize that through seeing it, the better. That's very interesting. We're gonna, um Move to questions in about five minutes, uh, four minutes. So if you are percolating a question, I think there'll be a microphone uh, in the center. Um, you'll be able to line up. And again, just want to emphasize that we give priority to students and that all questions do end with a question mark. Um, maybe with this last few minutes that we have, um, I would love just really quickly from all three of you, um, I would be very interested to hear what your reaction was um, when the news of the Supreme Court, the, the very uh, momentous Supreme Court leak occurred. 
I, someone else start. <laughs> <laughs> I am right now gearing up to study the end of row, and I've been working on it for, you know, maybe five or six months to look at the last person served in a state before the Supreme Court makes this announcement and the, compared to the first person turned away after. And there are some states that will have nearly immediate implementation. There are some with 30 day or even 90 day grace periods, but there are some that are just, the, peop, the docs there are waiting to f for what the day that the Supreme Court makes its announcement. So I first misread the title and thought, oh no, they've made this announcement and I'm not ready, which is pretty <laughs> selfish to like think of study design instead of the actual consequences. But, um, you know, it's, um, it's, you know, and, and then the clinics are like, I'm talking to them now to say, can you please help me when this decision happens to help recruit people into the study? And they, you know, they don't know when they're going to close. And so their staff sort of want to leave because mm -hmm. they're going to close and they're going to be out of a job. Um, but, you know, if, ever, if, if the clinic staff leaves before the decision is announced, then they've shut down abortion before it's even required by law. So it's just total turmoil. Grim, and you're a legal scholar, so this yeah. was a, prof a great professional interest, obviously. Yes, I mean, I will say this. Like, I, I knew that when Ruth Bader Ginsburg died that Roe was dead, too. I mean, I, like, I knew that night that, that, that it was over. Um, so I've been preparing for this. I think a lot of legal scholars have, have really assumed this was going to be the result for a long time. Um, but I, you know, I actually had tested positive for COVID the, the day that happened. So like, it was just this like weird time of my life where I was in one room by myself thinking about, you know, and writing about, um, what this was going to mean. I, um, similarly, I kind of felt like that it was going to happen too, but then when it happened, um, I, it really ticks me off when, um, as a researcher, when the public opinion is reported one way, but I know that's not the truth. <laughs> it's kind of like, remember Obamacare? Like there was forever, um, oh, the country's divided on Obamacare, but then when you pulled the provisions, all of the provisions, everybody supported most of them, but it was like the political mess around it that, you know, and that just, so I kind of, I went into gear and I was like, um, actually, started an op-ed for the New York Times um, about how like this, the polling is just so bad. And it's just, um, I think both the polling and then the reporting, which is based on the polling, is just quite harmful. Um, and it's part of the part of the reason we are where, where we are. So I kind of just kicked it into the gear. So gear. just to be clear, are you suggesting, Tressa, that what we've always come to take as an article of faith in polling that the country is not roughly divided or slightly more um, uh, pro-abortion rights than anti-abortion. You're saying that's not the case, in fact, or that it is the case on that um, top line question, and then as you get into the particulars, it's much more murky. I would say right now it's on, I, I would say it's not the case that it's been divided forever. It's the case that Gallup asks, are you pro-life or pro um, or pro-choice forever? And that's a flat line. But guess what? When you ask people, are you both or neither? Oh, suddenly 40% are both or neither. Now you only have 25% or, you know? So it's like, it's hard, it's hard to even know. But when you ask, again, when I've asked, get down to the fundamentals, who do you want making these decisions? Do you want new laws on this issue? That's when I get, 65, 70% saying no. Okay. Um, nobody be shy. Step right up. Again, we'll start with students. Um, who would like to go ahead and ask the first question? Yes, you. You. You're the one. Hi. Um, my name is Millie, and I'm a 1L here. So, you know, Justin, I'm not the best to answer your stupid question. <laughs> um, but I was wondering whether there's any, uh, like, convincing arguments on the side that even if this goes back to the states, like, this shouldn't be part of their police power like to regulate what a woman does with abortion or a person who can have a pregnancy with an abortion. So like in one of my classes, we read like Jacobson versus Massachusetts, I think it was called about vaccine mandates and how that's like uh, potentially an area of law that could fall under this court that like the states don't have that power. So I was wondering if there's any argument that the states 
shouldn't have the power to stop some abortion. Well, first, thanks for, I hope, I don't know if your finals are done yet, but I know one of finals are, are a pretty rough time. Um, so, I mean, generally, states have been given the police powers to regulate health and safety, right? So in general, um, when it comes to, like, medical procedures, there are even parts, um, people that would say the federal government cannot do this because it's one of the things that is specifically reserved for the states in the context of the practice of medicine. Um, and so to the extent that abortion is health care, it's one of those things that would generally fall within and kind of the state's um, general powers. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, um, I'm Kate Davis. I'm a first year in the college. Thank you so much. This has been really interesting, um, definitely very enlightening for me. Um, I was wondering about your opinions on the potential for federal um, oversight or, you know, like any, uh, you know, the capacity for the federal government to play a role in the future, not only just for protecting abortion rights, but also what you guys have been discussing in terms of contraception and sort of the crumbling of these building blocks that you mentioned on regarding constitutional law. Great question. So, yeah, I mean, I, I think my co-authors and I are, are actually really pushing this argument. Um, so, you know, there is a little bit of a narrative out there that the Biden administration can't do anything, right, because Congress cannot pass a law. Um, and our perspective is to really push and stress the fact that that's not true, um, that the Biden administration has control of executive agencies. One of those agencies is HHS, and within HHS is the FDA. The FDA controls the regulation of abortion-inducing um, drugs, mifepristone and mesoprostol. Um, and so, actually, there's a lot that the Biden administration could do w within the gambit of these drugs. And so this gets back to that earlier question, right, because traditionally the states are reserved um, the right to regulate the practice of medicine, but the federal government is reserved the right to regulate drugs through the Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act. Um, and so the, the Biden administration, or the FDA in general, has overregulated mifepristone ever since it was approved in 2000. Um, it's one of the safest drugs available, yet it's under um, a what's known as a REMS, um, which is a specific protocol that makes it much um, harder to access. Um, and so one of the things the Biden administration could do on its own um, is to remove some of these unnecessary restrictions on the drug. Um, it could also pursue a, a variety of legal theories, which I won't bore you all with unless you want to hear them, um, that would try to say, no, actually, this, um, the federal law preempts state law. Um, and so the federal government can come in and say, you cannot ban an FDA-approved drug forcing states to allow the sale of medication abortion. So mm. I certainly agree that there are, there are federal strategies, and though most people seem totally focused on a Congress passing a statute that's never going to happen, actually, the Biden administration could do a lot. Hi, I'm Jacob. I'm a first year in the college, and I was, I know it's like hard to pin down, but I was wondering if Roe were to be overturned and then the right to privacy, how likely would you rate the possibility of other rights, especially LGBT rights, being overturned, and how fast do you think we might see that happen? Oh, good question. I, I'm not sure. Um, it's hard to say. I think, you know, I think it's probably, I think that when we talk about contraceptives, um, Plan B and IUDs are really, I would be really worried about them in certain states. But other than that, I don't think states are going to go after contraceptives. When it comes to LGBT rights, though, there's a lot of folks who want to attack that. Um, and so I would not be surprised if we start to see the beginnings of legal challenges to say, oh, now that Roe is gone, that calls into a question Obergefell and other cases, and so we're going to start to litigate those. Um, the process of doing that would take years, to, and it would have to be the Supreme Court that would overturn it. And, you know, you might not be able to get someone like Kavanaugh to sign on to that. Um, so I do think that, you know, a lot of things would have to fall into place, and it would take a long time, but it is, you know, something that becomes more vulnerable. Yeah, uh, my name is Ernie Norman. I'm an alum sometime last century. Uh, <laughs> my question, or a group of questions actually, I have not heard much about, much discussion about the economic effects on jurisdictions that impose such rules. Now, just as a small example, in 2016 to 2017, uh, the NCAA moved their tournament out of North Carolina because of some gender-based laws great economic effect on some of those communities, but relatively small to what, what would happen with corporations. I'm wondering if you know anything about corporations that may be thinking of leaving or not moving into some of these jurisdictions. But first, I think the most important issue here is recruiting. 
how will these laws affect recruiting for these companies? And first, I'm going to ask, I think there are a lot of students here, and I want to get their opinions on this, <laughs> because presumably all the students here, at some point in the not too distant future, will be looking for a job. And what I want to know is, will these laws and the, uh, the social climate that goes with it have any effect on your decisions as to whether to look for a job or accept a job in certain areas? Uh, first, which of you, this doesn't matter at all. You don't care at all about these laws and the social implications. It's the job, the job, the job. How many of you feel that way? <laughs> Not too many. Conversely, how many of you, when looking uh, at a company, a possible employer, will look at the laws in that jurisdiction, and that'll play at least maybe a, only a small role, but a role in your decision? Anybody? So it's uh, somewhat similar. I know that um, you know there are, there are people who won't go to. I've heard of students who won't look at colleges for some, for example, in an open carry state, or uh, and certainly the the law um, challenges for companies that the gentleman referred to. Um, the only, Diana, the only, you're probably the only person I think whose work might touch on that, or did yours also? I'm curious to hear if either of you have have crossed that Rubicon yet, because it's all pretty nascent. I thought his first question was going to be about how the economy will be harmed when people can't get abortions, because we have seen that people are more likely to become poor. But um, I don't think we're going to like be measuring this in changes to the GDP, because these are people who, the people who won't be able to get an abortion are the people who are already low income. And so I don't think that, I, I, I don't think it's that their economy will tank because of abortion. Um, it's like the it, this will be a huge impact on the people who are affected, but it, I don't think it'll be on the state. But your question was actually about um, corporate finances, and um, the same time I get asked by reporters about how it hurts families, I get, well, can't corporations just pay their employees to travel out of state when they want abortions? And it's hard for me to get at all excited about that idea, like you're, you have to ask your employer when you need an abortion. And, and, if they're, and they certainly shouldn't be giving better abortion benefits than they do birth benefits. It's just that seems like a mess of a solution. So I don't know. But, I, but apparently some companies are thinking about this because they're already hyping their abortion travel fund. Mm -hmm. Saw that, yeah. Teresa, do you have we, anything on that? Yeah, we did conduct a survey, I think it was last fall, among college-educated mm -hmm. um, adults in the workforce, and we asked, um, this was after Texas, would you apply for a job? And we kind of described the Texas law, you know, six-week ban on abortion. Would you apply for a job in a state that passed a law like the Texas one? 62% um, said no. So um, I, I think it will affect um, um, people who, and this this is a foundation who was interested in sort of top talent. So we looked at college educated, to your point. Um, but I think it, I think it will. The combination of these laws and anti-trans laws and voting restrictions. You know, they young people especially kind of see all those things connected. So um, you know, I think I think it, I think we would we will start seeing some of that. Step up, please. Hi, my name is Divya Marotra. I'm a first year at the college uh, studying political science and business economics. So uh, most recently, Oklahoma passed a near, almost near total abortion ban. And particularly a comment made by the governor was in regards to federal reservations in, on, in Oklahoma, considering that they make up a significant part of the state. So I wanted to know a little bit more about like the legal um, implications of, let's say, a federal reservation protecting abortion rights, but then the state having a abortion near total abortion ban what like what's the gray area there yes um, so it's it's a really good question um, my co-authors and I actually have a whole section in our paper where we talk about federal land um, we've been really careful actually to avoid the question of native land because you know a lot of people you know we don't want to suggest that indigenous peoples have a right or an obligation to come save anybody um, and so, you know, we've really been focusing on federal land, but within every state, ha there is parts of the state that have little enclaves that, are, that is owned by the federal government. And we have, um, in fact, you know, pushed the idea that 
um, the, the the government could lease land on this on its federal property to abortion providers. And it turns out that there's different laws that apply there, right? So when we talk about civil laws, the only civil laws, state civil laws that apply on federal land are those that were in existence at the time um, that the land was you know given to the federal government. So this is not going to apply to something like SB8 in Texas because right that was didn't exist long ago. Um, when we talk about the criminal law, um, there's basically a, a federal law that says state criminal law does not apply on federal land if it's against federal policy. And there's a strong argument that the FDA's regulation of um, abortion-inducing drugs in particular would be in conflict with a, um, a state law that bans, um, med that bans abortion you know, from, you know, the, from the get-go. Um, and so, yeah, I think federal land is a super interesting um, question, whether or not we have an executive that is willing to um, you know, pursue that, that theory um, is another matter. Please. Hi, uh, my name is Emily Barnett. I'm a first year grad student, thank you, studying public policy. Uh, one question that came up while I was listening to the conversation was regarding medical school. And so there are a lot of medical schools that are, you could yeah. potentially, once students are in their residencies, there are certain things that they couldn't practice, but I'm curious if there are any legal obligations that those universities have to not teach healthcare education that crosses into abortion territory. And if there's anything that like, the, if there's a line between education and the medical board and, and state policy. That is such a great question and I don't have a really full answer for you, but um, uh, right now there are, um, I think to get an OBGYN certified, there are questions about abortion. So you should know then what are they gonna teach if it's banned, that will, is a question. I know that right now where Texas is so scaled back in its abortion care that medical students are traveling to California to get trained. Hmm. But, um, but I mean, that is a big mess of a situation to, of, of how to teach and whether they can teach um, at a state medical school, a public medical school. I don't think all the answers are sorted out. Maybe you have more to add. And, and I'll just note that, um, you know, the funny, the one thing that's interesting is that the same procedures and drugs that are used for abortion are used for miscarriage management and used for stillbirth management, right? So, um, you know, people get DNCs and DNEs when they have a natural fetal demise. They take MIFB and, and MISO when they have a natural fetal demise that is not um, evacuating on its own. And so, um, you know, there is concerns about, you know, so theoretically, right, a lot of the same procedures could be taught in the context of um, miscarriage. Um, but we're learning from Texas and elsewhere that in states that make abortion um, harder to get, they just don't even teach them at all. If you look at other countries that ban abortion, for instance, um, they ha are much more likely to have policies on the books that if you're experiencing a missed or incomplete miscarriage, there's no treatment offered. You have to wait until the miscarriage completes on its own, or you have to wait you know, three to four weeks before anyone will offer anything. Um, and so, again, these are repercussions that, that people might see. Please. Hi, I'm Zoe. I'm a third year in the college. Um, obviously, after the draft opinion was leaked, there was a pretty swift and strong uh, reaction, especially along the pro-choice side of things. Um, a lot of protesting, a lot of mass mobilization or activism. So I'm curious, pretty simply, like, how effective do you think that kind of protesting or sort of community level activism is and how much can that have a bottom up effect since so much of what we're talking about is rooted in decades of case law and the constitution mm -hmm. and other sort of policy, federal or state level issues. Teresa, that one you can grab? Yeah. Um, does it have a real effect? I mean, it's, it's, it's hard to, I don't want to say no. Um, I think it does have an effect in terms of, it's kind of like after um, President Trump got elected in 2016 and there was that massive women's march, that had a huge effect on people's opinions and it made, um, you know, I would say maybe 50% people who voted Democrat, um, women, um, you know, uh, more progressive folks, it, it made them feel like, oh my gosh, I'm not alone. Um, we can do something. I, every, a lot of other people think like me. And I think that has that, that effect. But in terms of, you know, the political realities in the country, 
And, you know, Congress right now is not able to pass any type of federal law. Um, you know, Republicans are very likely to, you know, regain the House. Um, does that have any immediate impact? Um, will it have an impact in these states that are going to make it illegal? Probably. I, it's hard to say in the short term that, that it might. Please come ahead. Hi, um, my name is Elizabeth. I'm a first year in the college, and I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about what you think the effects will be on the 2022 midterms and whether, like, the release of this opinion and when it goes into effect will have an impact on who we elect in November. Gosh, it's this is really hard to predict. Um, we uh, did some polling um, prior to the decision, but it was about, like, let's say the Supreme Court overturns Roe. Would that make you more likely to um, get out and vote? Would it may make you more likely to vote for pro-choice, pro-life, anti-abortion folks? And th that data suggests maybe like 10 points more motivated um, or more likely to vote for a pro-choice candidate. Um, it, it suggests that uh, pro-choice folks are a little bit more likely um, to get up to say, yes, I'd be more motivated to vote. But that's in the hypothetical. And I think if this was... If this happened in like um, 2014, I think I'd be much more confident saying, yes, it'll have an impact. I think right now, a lot of people who it would have an impact with are just really struggling, exhausted, um, t I mean, tired from the news. Um, there's a lot of other stuff going, going on that might sort of depress the vote. So it's a big question mark. Um, we have time for one more question. I hope it's not super long, so please step to the mic. I don't think it is. I'm Nicole. I'm a 1L. And you might have already answered this, so I apologize if so, but I read recently that states have not crossed the line of criminalizing abortion for the women who are seeking abortions. Is that, what is the reason for that? I know Louisiana just had their, they just uh, shut down their bill attempting to criminalize it, but do you think that will change anytime soon? Yeah, so I mean, I do, I do predict it will change. I think right now the anti-abortion movement is just kind of keeping that line in the sand that it's always had. Um, I think the question becomes, you know, what, you know, I think the, in the, the next year, the anti-abortion movement's gonna be so focused on just getting their state bans in, intact. Um, and then, you know, like, like we had from Texas, a lot of data is going to start coming out that's going to reveal how many of their citizens are traveling, how many of them are getting pills from aid access. And at that point, you might see states that are starting to be, oh, okay, well, it's not good enough to ban abortion. If we want to stop abortions, we have to, you know, stop travel and we have to stop pills. And how are we going to do that? Um, and when we think about abortion pills in particular, you know, one of the only ways to really get at that is to go after people. Um, so many of you know that right, a person was arrested in Texas, uh, Lizelle Herrera, um, even though there was no state law that allowed that, right? So you could also see anti-abortion prosecutors who are just willing to, to do that to chill abortion, right? To just um, say that, um, you know, get people to have fewer abortions. And I'll also note again, right, that there are st other, you know, state laws that have been used and are being used to prosecute pregnant women for abortions, um, but they're usually later abortions, right? So Purvi Patel is a famous example, but there are others where someone buys abortion medication online and ends up delivering delivering um, in their bathroom, right? And, and sometimes uh, the state has tried to prosecute those people with feticide or murder, child neglect. Um, and so, you know, we can expect that to happen too. Well, this has been really interesting and informative. I know I've learned a lot. I want to thank um, all of you for coming, especially our very brilliant students. And thank you to this exceptional panel uh, for all that you were able to provide to us. Uh, we really appreciate you coming to uh, IOP and to Chicago. Thank you. Everybody. Yeah. Thank you.